and welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Christian Despina, and today we're delighted to welcome back my friend and co-host J.L. Bell, author of The Road to Concord, How Four Stolen Cannon Ignited the Revolutionary War, and also the creator of the vastly popular blog, Boston 1775. Today we will be discussing Crispus Attucks, a name familiar to most of us since our early grade school days, but also a figure we really don't know much about. And today's guest is going to help us navigate through nearly three centuries of the actual and the mythic story that has surrounded Attucks. Mitch Kashun is Professor Emeritus of History at Western Michigan University. He earned his doctorate from history from Cornell University, and he specializes in African-American history, collective memory, and historical writing. We've asked Professor Kashun to talk, chat with us today because he is the author of First Martyr of Liberty, Crispus Attucks in American Memory, now available in paperback from, the universe, from Oxford University Press. Mitch Kachun is also the author of Festivals of Freedom, Memory and Meaning in African-American Emancipation Celebrations, 1808 to 1915, and co-editor of The Curse of Caste or The Slave Bride, a rediscovered African-American novel by Julia C. Collins, in addition to numerous articles and book chapters. Kachun's current research focuses on African-American journalist Charles Stewart, who wrote featured columns for several black newspapers in the early 20th century. Mitch, welcome to the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society interview series. Thank you very much, I'm really happy to be here. Mitch, I just wanna start off with this uh, question. How did you come to study African-American history and in particular, African-American commemorations in media? Hmm. Well, you know, I, I started grad school without having a real focus other than American history, cultural history generally. Um, it, it seemed that every, every class that I took, every op I seemed to gravitate toward topics relating to African-Americans. And I was really pretty ignorant of African-American history when I entered grad school. And I was just drawn to these topics. And, and the more I read and the more research papers I wrote and, and uh, you know, consulting with colleagues and mentors, the more it became clear to me that you can't really understand American history without really taking full account of the African, African-American presence from the very beginning. Um, and so I, I just moved into that, uh, into that field. And uh, uh, in terms of memory studies, I, when I went to uh, uh, Cornell for my PhD, I worked with Michael Kamen. Um, who had just, uh, that was in the early 90s, he had just published his massive uh, book, Mystic Chords of Memory, uh, relating to uh, memory and tradition in American culture. So that certainly had an influence on my, uh, my orientation toward thinking about commemoration and memory and so on. And, and in Michael's book, um, great book, I think it's a you know, pathbreaking book, but wasn't a heck of a lot on African American history. And that really sort of got me thinking about, well, th there's gotta be a story there, uh, multiple stories there. And right. I started to look into those and that turned into my dissertation, uh, which looked at uh, primarily 19th century and early 20th century emancipation celebrations, um, you know, which took place of course, well before US emancipation with uh, celebrations of the abolition of the slave trade, uh, West Indian emancipation in the 1830s, and so on. And, and that's sort of where I, I stumbled onto Crispus Attucks. Right. Thank you. Uh, okay. First, Martyr of Liberty is about Crispus Attucks, but it's not a biography. It's a history of what Attucks has represented in American culture. Uh, so to ground us as we get deeper into that topic, Mitch, tell us what biographical detail we really know about the real Crispus Attucks. Uh, not a heck of a lot. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, scholars have, have, have looked for generations uh, for biographical information about him, but uh, what we can say with a significant degree of, of certainty, he was probably born in uh, or around the Framingham, Massachusetts area uh, in the 1720s, uh, more than likely uh, was, uh, of, was pretty clearly of mixed race uh, and most accounts and uh, what seems to be the most plausible stories have him with uh, an African born father and a Native American mother uh, where the, the surname Attucks would come from. 
why he doesn't have the father's surname, how that works is, is really unclear. We have no real documentation of his family, early family history. There was a runaway ad in 1750 for a large uh, mulatto man named Crispus who had escaped from a William Brown of Framingham. And it's uh, most, most scholars agree that that's probably the same Crispus. It's a very uncommon name. He's described very similarly to the man who shows up in 1770. So after that uh, successful escape uh, from servitude in 1750, more than likely he spent most of that time as a sailor working around the docks around the Atlantic seaboard. Uh, we have some evidence uh, from the time of the Boston massacre that he was based in the Bahamas and New Providence is uh, the town that, uh, name at that time. Um, he was about to sail for North Carolina. He, so it, it's, seems pretty clear he was not a resident of Boston. It's unclear how frequently he popped into Boston on his rounds across the Atlantic. We don't know how, how far afield he went if he, if he was uh, involved in uh, trade across the Atlantic, if it was mainly up and down the seaboard. Uh, and of course he, he meets his fate uh, March 5th, 1770 with several other colonists. Right. Yeah, well, let, let me ask you this, Mitch. How did people of Boston in March 1770 respond in particular to Attucks' death? I mean, was he treated differently from other victims of the Boston Massacre? Um, yes and no. Um, he was identified, well, initially he was misidentified in the first newspaper accounts that came out uh, as uh, Michael Johnson. And that's actually the name that shows up on his autopsy report. And I'm really unclear as to what most people have, have just sort of assumed that well, when, since he was from the area, he was using a, a, a different name while, while he was in Boston, so he wouldn't be found out. But I think it's just as likely that uh, someone that maybe there was another black seaman in Boston at that time named Michael Johnson who looked like addicts and he was simply misidentified. So I'm not sure which, which story is there. But in any case, he was identified as a mulatto, so a man of mixed race. And um, uh, in those initial accounts, at least, and certainly in the trial of the soldiers, which came later in 1770, the soldiers and then the Captain Preston, uh, John Adams, who was the lead defense attorney for those soldiers, made a it really singled addicts out uh, using a lot of different kinds of uh, derogatory phrases. Uh, one, he, he had uh, you know, set out to become the hero of the night, which he did not mean in a laudatory way <laughs> that he was, the, he was the chief mischief maker. Um, in one phrase, he says, you know, the very looks of addicts was enough to terrify anyone. So really calling and making it clear that he was an addicts of Framingham. Uh, so that would clearly connote to, to Bostonians that this was an outsider. This was not a man from Boston. And, and this is to a large extent what addicts was doing in his defense. Uh, he had to walk a fine line there because he did not want to... Uh, get on the wrong side of uh, Boston's growing patriot movement. Um, uh, so he, he really casts these uh, instigators of, of the action on, on March 5th as outsiders. There was this uh -huh. Irishman, Patrick Carr, this addicts from Framingham, this mixed race man whose looks was enough to terrify anyone. Um, he said that at one point, I think the uh, even to call this group a mob is, is too respectable for them. So. Uh, so he cast addicts in a very negative light and he was successful in, in getting the soldiers acquitted. And but moving it, ahead in time, how did Americans remember addicts in the first decades after the revolution and what forces and what people brought him um, into public attention again on his way to becoming a household name? Yeah, well, he, uh, he sort of got a, a collectively grouped with the other four men who were killed that day um, in the orations that took place every March 5th from 1771 to 1783. Uh, and that was discontinued, of course, with the end of the revolution and July 4th uh, became the, the date of celebration. But in Boston, these, these orations, which of course, uh, Dr. Warren uh, gave those or a couple of those orations in the early 1770s. Um, none, the, the, generally, the uh, individuals were not named. 
I think only John Hancock just names them, just listing their names. The rest don't even mention them. They're just collectively referred to as our brethren, our fellow citizens slaughtered by this tyrannical standing army. So in that sense, addicts, and he's buried, of course, uh, collectively with the other soldiers in the old granary uh, burying ground. Uh, so he is not treated differently in that respect. And he is uh, lauded although unnamed and not racially identified, uh, so that people reading about the, the massacre after those first accounts in Boston or outside of the city, uh, you know, because that news spread throughout the colonies, they would have no idea that this was, there was a person of color who was among the victims. Um, he's mentioned in a couple early histories of the revolution in the 1780s and 1790s. Uh, he shows up but really he disappears from American collective memory. And even African-Americans do not um, uh, make any reference to him that I have found. And I've looked pretty hard uh, until the late 1830s uh, when I have a reference of uh, a sermon being given in Boston uh, by a black minister named J.C. Beeman in 1839. And he makes reference to addicts. He gets the last name wrong, but it's clear who he's talking about. And of course, William C. Nell, uh, well-known uh, Boston abolitionist. Uh, the first reference that I have, uh, well, Nell was present at that celebration where Beeman mentions him. And then in 1841, there's some correspondence between him and Nell and, and Wendell Phillips, where he mentions his research, trying to look into the life of addicts and not finding much. Um, so what happened, I think, in the 1830s was that you have the revolutionary generation, uh, there was a new round of, of pension, uh, uh, pensions being uh, uh, doled out. Uh, of course, the 50th anniversary had just passed of, of the declaration. And in the 1830s, uh, George Robert Twelve Hughes publishes a couple of his, uh, you know, or, you know, a couple of memoirs of his are, are published. And uh, there, there was also a history of the revolution by an Italian historian named uh, Carlo Botta. It came out in 1820, but there were multiple editions in the 1830s. So that's where I think Nell uh, came across uh, you know, uh, uh, Christmas Addicts initially. And, uh, and that's what got him uh, sort of as the momentum for a biracial abolitionist movement was really accelerating in the 1830s and into the 1840s. Uh, Addicts became very useful for black abolitionists making their case not only for abolition, but for full and equal citizenship rights. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I, just on a personal note, I was shocked at how many times they got Addicts's name wrong. <laughs> you know, yeah. how many people, yeah, it was just shocking to me. And you mentioned Dr. Joseph Warren, and I'm glad because there's a frontispiece from 1855 and it's portraying Addicts in a very similar vein to Dr. Joseph Warren and John Trumbull's painting, The Death of General Warren at the Battle of Bunker's Hill, which is emphasizing Addicts as a victim. So there's other antebellum descriptions and portrayals that really cast Addicts in a very much, in a much more aggressive role. So can you discuss the different portrayals and what the creator's intentions were? Yeah, yeah, that and that Trumbull painting, it, it, the similarities are really striking. And right. it's almost this, this Pieta kind of pose. So there's this sort of the martyrdom of Christ is, is brought into this mix as well. Uh, and that painting was pretty well known in the, the you know, first half of the 19th century. Uh, so I think that was a very conscious choice uh, for the frontispiece of, of this, you know, again, it was William Nell's book, Colored Patriots of the Revolution, uh, presenting addicts as a martyr. And he was referred there as the first martyr of the American Revolution. Um, but yeah, there were other characterizations uh, in, in images and in text. Uh, even as early as the uh, early 1830s, I, I found an 1831 uh, school book written by Samuel Goodrich, uh, Peter mm -hmm. Parley fame. Um, Samuel Goodrich had a very negative uh, interpretation of Addicts' role, very similar to what John Adams was laying out in the trial, that this was, and the mob in general, he characterized the mob as attacking the soldiers without provocation, and they basically got what they deserved. And there's a small image with a black man holding a club over his head, which is consistent with descriptions of eyewitnesses at the trial. Um, and and the, the, cap, sub, the subtitle of that image, the caption was something like, 
uh, people attacking the soldiers. Uh, so he it was a very negative, aggressive characterization. Right. But then in the 1850s, you have this uh, lithograph uh, uh, by Bufford Champney, uh, Bufford and Champney, I'm not, I forget the, the sequence now, but uh, showing also in the center of, of the image, uh, very so, somewhat similar in the background to Paul Revere's famous image of the massacre, but uh, having a, a black man at the center holding a club. And in this case, the aggressiveness is usually interpreted as a positive thing, like using that assertive, aggressive stance against the tyrannical standing army in order to assert American independence. So there's right. quite, quite a lot going on uh, right. in that period. Earlier, Mitch, you mentioned uh, Attucks' Native American ancestry. And how, in if, if any way, did that affect his symbolic place in American history, especially in this period of westward expansion? You know, it, it really didn't, as far as I can tell. And, you know, I've given other talks about the book and, and, and had uh, Q&A with, with folks, uh, so, and some of whom have asserted that, uh, you know, William Nell, for example, who really was the most significant figure in bringing back Attucks' memory and, and creating uh, an image of him, a symbolic image to fight for black citizenship rights as someone who was there at the founding, so to speak. Um, that, uh, that people like Nell uh, acknowledged um, uh, Attucks' native ancestry, but I don't see that. In fact, just earlier today, I went and revisited uh, Colored Patriots and read the section on Attucks, and he's re referenced there as a mulatto, in one place as a black man. And this was the thing about uh, Nell uh, and, and black abolitionists in general. They wanted to really emphasize his African-American ancestry. They did not really, uh, sometimes a passing mention of native ancestry, but it was often not even acknowledged at all. Uh, because they wanted to emphasize the fight for black citizenship. And, and Native peoples, uh, and this is speculation on my part, because I, I don't, don't, haven't really found any sources from Native peoples um, referencing addicts, but to me it just seems that they're not so much concerned as African Americans were with asserting their American citizenship. They were more focused in this period uh, on, on uh, emphasizing their own sovereignty, their own national sovereignty. So Attucks was not a useful figure for them in the same way that he was for Black Americans. Hmm. You know, I, I couldn't help but th but think when I was reading the book that really Attucks seems like a paradox, right? I think we can all agree that of all the massacre victims, he has the most name recognition, right? So here's this working class person of color involved in one of the most iconic events and and early American history, but really relegated to somewhat of a token footnote, right? He's martyred in the yeah. cause of liberty. He's portrayed throughout our history as both a hero and a villain. So can you comment on some of these tensions and, and paradoxes of Crispus Attucks' memory? Yeah, and, and this you know, takes us into the 20th and 21st centuries as well, because there's a lot of, there, there, there are multiple different uh, ways of looking at Attucks um, by, from, from both blacks and whites. And, and, and eventually native people. Um, so you, know, you have these two characterizations that predominate in the 19th century of the, the, the black abolitionists and white abolitionists as well, looking at Attucks as uh, someone who was a patriot. He was a martyr to the cause of liberty. Uh, he, he demonstrates Af the, the African-Americans um, uh, citizenship rights should be acknowledged. Uh, and on the other hand, he was this rabble rouser. He was probably this drunken sailor who was just out looking to bust some heads on March 5th, and, and, that's, that, and he was really a threat to the social order. Um, but even in the beginning in the mid 19th century even, but more, more prominently in the, after the 1930s and into the 1960s, there were some African-Americans who saw addicts as sort of a sellout, that here he was, you know, risking his life. He was this assertive, aggressive man, but he was fighting not for black liberation, uh, but for the, the white enslavers who were behind the revolution. Um, you see references to that in the 1930s and very, I, I note in the book, Stokely Carmichael uh, 
key figure in the Black Power movement in the 1960s, uh, made those kinds of references to addicts that, you know, you know, he shouldn't have been doing that. He should have been fighting for black people. And several black, John, John Rock, who was an uh, abolitionist and a very interesting figure in himself in the mid 19th century, even in some of the earliest uh, commemorations, March 5th commemorations in Boston in I think 1859 and 60, uh, John Rock said, you know, I'd, I'd rather celebrate the, the deeds of Nat Turner or John Brown than Crispus Attucks because again, they were fighting for black liberation. Right. And, and there's lots of other people who have argued over the years, uh, you know, the, the image of him as a rabble rouser and a troublemaker um, uh, persists. Uh, you know, there was one incident in uh, uh, 2000, the year 2000, uh, there was an effort to get a bridge in Framingham named for Crispus Attucks. Um, and the, the eminent uh, revolutionary historian, Pauline Meyer, was interviewed by a newspaper and she was quoted as saying, this is a fairly close paraphrase, that you know, Attucks was identified as someone who was coming up, leading a band of, of 20 sailors up Corn Hill and he was carrying a, a, a large club. He sounds like a thug to me. So even in that context, uh, he's characterized in that way. Right. Um, but others, others still say, look, this guy shouldn't be in the history books at all. He's, he's, he's a nobody, he's probably a, a troublemaker. He didn't, have, he didn't make any great contribution uh, to American history. Uh, so it's, he, he should, and especially in the 1960s, as textbooks begin to include African-Americans, Attucks makes, is, comes in as a very convenient token of the black presence in the revolutionary era. Uh, you put in a, you know, you have a little section on the Boston Massacre, which virtually all, uh, you know, elementary, middle school, high school, collegiate textbooks have a section on the Boston Massacre. You just add a sentence that there's a black man there, and you, and, and that sort of, you've done your 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 uh, your due diligence. You've, you've fulfilled the obligation of, of including a black face in this story, right. and that, yeah, that's really insufficient, but. So, right. so that's that's sort of the range that we're dealing with in terms of how addicts is characterized. Yeah. Over the decades, there have been many organizations, schools, and other institutions named after addicts. There have been children's books. There have been comic books, uh, often in imaginative detail. And so, I are there patterns in uh, the myths and misconceptions that have uh, accreted around addicts as a symbol? And uh, while we're talking about that. Uh, tell us about the image on the front cover of your book. Yeah, uh, let's talk about, about that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thanks for holding it up so everyone can see. Um, and I, I love the phrase uh, imaginative detail, which is a, a, a nice way of saying people just made stuff up. <laughs> and that's, that's really a lot of what was going on because, again, we have so little uh, concrete evidence that, that can be verified about his life. Um, that uh, he's sort of a blank slate, that people can impose whatever meaning suits their purpose, whether it is to characterize him as a rowdy villain troublemaker or as the patriotic uh, you know, martyr to the cause of liberty or, or anything else. Um, so yeah, and, and mythology is widespread. Uh, and, and you know, Black, by the, by the end of the 19th century, it, he, he shows up, I mentioned the, the Samuel Goodrich school book that mentions addicts in a negative light. There are numerous school books uh, throughout the, the antebellum period and the Civil War era uh, that did mention addicts either in a positive or negative light. It was sort of a, a mix. Um, but after the 1880s, he disappears from any accounts in mainstream school books that I have found. I didn't look at every single school book after the 1880s. But from the 1880s into the 1960s, or maybe the late 1950s, the civil rights era, uh, addicts uh, is not in any uh, mainstream uh, school books, uh, history books about uh, the, you know, the, the American Revolutionary era. So African-American writers have to rely on their own works to maintain his memory, to keep his memory alive. And they do that beginning in the 1880s by often uh, creating stories about addicts. A couple of key books that came out in the 1880s, uh, uh, one by William Simmons and one by George Washington Williams. I almost blanked on the name there. Um, 
really construct an addict who was well read. He was a, a, a member of the Sons of Liberty. He was a close associate of John Adams. He was good looking. You find so all kinds of things that we just don't know about this man. He was well versed in political philosophy, and these things sort of get recycled over and over uh, across the generations. In a lot of uh, by the 20th century, in a lot of juvenile biographies about addicts, there are a lot of collective biographies of black heroes that start appearing in the 1920s and 30s. And he always has a prominent place there. And often he's mischaracterized. And, and often because of the, these things getting repeated over and over again, when he does start to show up in mainstream textbooks, uh, school books in the, uh, after the 1960s, some of these myths are recycled uh, about him being a member of the Sons of Liberty or, or, or things along those lines. Um, uh, so it's, it was challenging uh, to tease out what we can know and what was fabricated and where some of these stories came from. Yeah. And uh, the cover of your book shows one uh, very dramatic portrayal, uh, yeah. which we didn't get to see, right? Which we didn't get to see? Oh. Or, well, except on your book. Except on the book, that's right, and, and inside the book. Uh, yeah, it, and, and this, this relates, you know, starting in the late 30s, um, there were several efforts to get a Hollywood uh, film made about the life of Crispus Attucks. Um, and none of these ever came to fruition. The image on the cover there is from a, a, a projected film from the early 1970s. And it was, the, the film was to be titled Crispus. And it got, I guess, far enough into production that they hired a fairly well-known graphic artist named Robert Frankenberg to create that image. And uh, uh, I, I was fortunate enough to get a hold of the person. He's still alive. He's in his 90s, retired in oh. Boca Raton, Florida, who has who was the president of the film company. Uh, thank goodness for Google uh, <laughs> as a historical <laughs> researcher. That's that's how I found the yeah, got the rights to this image. Uh, he was very gracious. And you know what, what what is really striking about it? If you can, what if you can hold it up again? Yeah. Here is Crispus Attucks. Okay, he's got the club over his head the way a couple of the 19th century images does, but here he is bare chested. Right. So think about the early 1970s. This is the era of the black exploitation films, right? Shaft and Superfly and Dolomite and all these guys. Right. So you have this bare chested uh, addicts literally flying across. His feet are not touching the ground in that image, <laughs> which wraps around the spine of the book. So, and I love just the dynamic nature of it. Uh, it's, so I was really happy to be able to get the rights and use that, use that image. Right. And thanks I, for asking about it too. <laughs> okay. And so Mitch, let me just ask you this. So during the eras of slavery, rampant discrimination, addicts was an important symbol for African-Americans. So what symbolic value does he hold in America today and for whom? Is he, is he more famous or popular than ever? And, and has our culture found other figures to represent the same ideas? Yeah, uh, you know, the, the, the symbolic role that he plays today to a large extent is, is much the same as what the abolitionists constructed in the, the mid 19th century. He is uh, the first martyr of liberty. He is a patriotic hero. He is a man who laid down his life for uh, the independence of the nation. Um, and that's, for, for people who recognize his name at all, um, often he's just, oh, was, wasn't he that, the black guy from the revolution? And, and really not know much more than that. Many, many people, uh, the name means nothing to them at all. But for those who do know something about him and, and, and attach some significance to him, most, and certainly African-Americans, most African-Americans, and I think many uh, white Americans and others as well, uh, continue to see him uh, in, in that patriotic light. And, you know, it's worth noting that uh, Native Americans, particularly uh, some of the, the, the nations around the Boston, uh, you know, Eastern Massachusetts area, uh, now do acknowledge him, as, and actually several different groups claim him as one of their own. Um, so, so that's that's something that's changed a little bit. In terms of, you know, there are there are lots of other figures that have played similar kinds of roles, uh, and, and you know, I focus on addicts, and that's all I write about in the book. I, I barely mention some of the others, but there are certainly lots and lots of figures, including uh, people who have a, a 
an association with violence, people like Denmark Vesey, who now has a monument in Charleston, and, and right. Matt Turner, we're still waiting for a monument uh, for him. Attic still has, well, Attic has, has the monument on Boston Common, but that's really the, generally the Boston Massacre Monument. So he plays that symbolic role. Um, many people do can still consider him irrelevant um, and basically taking up space in the American narrative that, that should have more prominent uh, people involved. Um, but to me, one of the interesting roles that he plays, he sort of feeds into this trope of violence in our culture that's often associated with black males and especially large black males. Um, Attucks was a large man, 6'2", over 200 pounds, and that was certainly quite large in the 18th century. Um, and, and, and that's one of the reasons you know, African Americans had this balancing act that they had to, to play. They, they promoted Attucks as an assertive man who was asserting his rights as an individual and his uh, citizenship in a nation that was yet to be born. Um, and, and through that claiming, have, you know, establishing a claim to citizenship. Uh, but on the other hand, this image of a large black man uh, exercising violence in the public sphere is a very persistent trope in our culture. Uh, and certainly that's the, John Adams played into that in the trial. Many uh, commentators in the 19th and 20th centuries played into that and, and still in the 21st. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, uh, journalist Amy Goodman uh, from the Democracy Now! Uh, network uh, made a comment shortly after the, uh, the death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. In, on Attic's Day, March 5th, 2015, she had a short commentary in which she compares the two men uh, and, and basically saying that, you know, here are two large black men who were struck down by authority figures of their day British Army and, and troops, and, and, and neither of those authority figures uh, were punished in any way uh, mm. for the death of this large black man. And, you know, the circumstances are, are surely different, but she was right. making the point, I, I think her comment was something along the lines of, um, you never know what's going to start a revolution and black lives matter. So I, I think that's a very timely thing in terms of how I think addicts should be remembered today, what symbolic value I, I think he should have. I, I don't think it's, it really matters whether or not he was a, a, a man who had American patriotism burning in his heart and he had these high ideals that he was fighting for. Uh, what, what he really symbolizes to me is, is the presence of people of color, uh, you know, a mixed, a mixed race, African and native man. And there were other people of color in that crowd on March 5th, 1770. And you know, many people uh, who are not steeped in the, the time period don't realize that one out of every five Americans, American colonists at that time was of African descent. Uh, certainly a lot more in South Carolina and Virginia than in a place like uh, Boston. But uh, even in Boston, you had you know, black people and native people playing these kind of public roles. And I think that's something that is lost on a lot of people who tend to see colonial and revolutionary America as a very white place. Hmm. Um, so I, I think that's the way we should remember him. And, and I think that his presence should help us reorient the way we think about American history and help to move us away from this kind of triumphalist narrative that has always excluded people of color, excluded or marginalized or vilified uh, black people like addicts. And to, to reorient us around and recenter our understanding of American history around the presence of black people. And certainly the institution of slavery uh, is a central component of American history that is often downplayed as a sort of thing that happened on the side and then we fixed it and, and, and then it all goes away. And I think that's not a healthy way to move forward as we're seeking to uh, establish some kind of restorative justice in our society in the 21st century. We have to come to terms with the, the presence of people like addicts, the presence of slavery, and, and uh, the central role that, that they played in shaping American history and culture. Right, right, that's a great point. And a more general question about memory and how we remember the uh, movement towards American independence. Uh, we tend to have a natural tendency to look for heroes, to look for virtues. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think that that is indeed the best way to read history or is it just something that everybody, every human falls into? 
does seem to be a, you know, a persistent pattern and not just in American culture, certainly around the world, establishing a heroic narrative. You know, every, uh, every nation needs a story that, that, that to orient its, its own citizens and, and people from outside the nation uh, to, to, and it's always, it tends to be a very progressive and triumphalist and, and positive and progressive story of uh, steady improvement. We've certainly seen that in our society. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I don't know that it's net, it seems that it's necessary in order to construct those kinds of narratives. And certainly uh, after the, the 19th, 18th, 19th century, as uh, Western nations are establishing their identity as nations, they all craft these, these narratives, these triumphalist narratives uh, to give people a real stake in the society and to, to construct a nation, to construct that kind of collective identity and certainly ha having heroes uh, to look back to, to emulate, to, uh, to idolize, to, to honor it with monuments and, and special days and so on. Uh, it's a very useful tool. And that's one of the things that, that fascinates me about studying collective memory and studying uh, commemorations is teasing out, you know, how do these stories get constructed? How does a person get to be a hero Whose purposes does that serve? Who, who creates these narratives? Who decides which people are gonna be ignored and which people are going to be uh, honored with monuments and so on? And, and certainly that's a relevant conversation to have in our society today, especially with all the, the conversation about Confederate uh, memorials and monuments uh, right. in, in the past you know, decade or so. Um, so those are convenient ways, but it, 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 what's fascinating to me and what I think people need to get to that next level of not just accepting the heroic narrative, but figuring out why that narrative got constructed the way it did. And, and that gives, a, I think, a, a deeper and more nuanced understanding of, of the history you're trying to bring forward. Right. Well, this has been great. And uh, this concludes the interview with Mitch Kashoon, author of First Martyr of Liberty, Crispus Attucks and American Memory. And Mitch, thank you so much for joining us and we hope you'll come back. I really enjoyed it. I'll be glad to come back when you when you ask me. <laughs> thank you. And on behalf of JL Bell and myself, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.